when everything was dark. And it seemed that the sun would never shine again. Your love, too strong, too wide, too deep for death to hold. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we praise you for the light of new life made possible through the risen Savior. We praise you for the new life that's shown on the first witnesses of the resurrection. We praise you for the light of the new life that continues to shine in our hearts today. Loving Heavenly Father, we pray that the Easter light of life, hope, and joy will live in us each day and that we will be bearers of that light into the lives of those around us this day and always. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son into the world to die in our place, taking the punishment that was rightfully ours for our sin, washing us white as snow. And we praise you, Father, this Easter morning that he is not dead, but he is risen just as he said. And we praise you, Father God, that he gives us, each and every one of us, the power of his resurrection to rise above sin and to live by his resurrection power, knowing that we too will be raised from the dead to live with you in heaven for all eternity. Father, we thank you for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Some years ago, a 14 foot bronze crucifix was stolen from Calvary Cemetery in Little Rock, Arkansas. It had stood at the entrance of the cemetery for more than 70 years. The cross had been placed there in 1930 by a Catholic bishop. At the time of its construction, it had been valued at more than $10,000. The thieves apparently cut the cross off at the base and hauled it off in a pickup truck. Police speculate that they stole it, cut it up, and sold it off for scrap. The estimated scrap value of the cross, $450. Obviously the thieves did not know the value of the cross. And that's the problem for many people. That was the problem for many people the day that Christ was crucified. And that remains the problem for many people today. People just do not understand the value of the cross. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, 
they crucified him there along with the criminals. One on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Two men, both suffering the same fate as Christ, but they deserved their fate. Just as honestly, we all deserve that same fate. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Two men, both the same and yet different. Both started down the same road that day, but at some point, they chose a different path. Both, both heard and both saw the same things, but they reached different conclusions. First, they reached a different conclusion about the man in the middle. The one joined the crowd. The one joined the crowd and hurled insults at Christ. He ridiculed the idea that Christ was the Messiah. But the other, the other man was repentant. He recognized that Christ, Christ was an innocent man. That Christ had done nothing wrong. That Christ actually was a king. A king ready to enter into his kingdom. Second, the two men reached different conclusions, not just about the man in the middle, but they also reached different conclusions about themselves. The first man... The first man failed to come to grips with his own sinfulness. There was no admission of guilt. There was no fear of God. And because of that, the other man rebuked him. For that man rightfully concluded that the two of them, they were being punished justly for their deeds. You see, without the comprehension that we are sinners, sinners in rebellion against God, sinners separated from a holy God, without that comprehension, we cannot and will not be saved. Third, the two men reach different conclusions about what they needed to be delivered from. 
the unrepentant man, he simply wanted deliverance from his present physical circumstances. Save yourself and us, he demanded from Christ, meaning don't let us die. But the second man, the repentant man, he realized that there is something beyond this present trouble. No matter how bad things were right there and right then, he understood that there was a more serious concern that awaited him. You see, someday, someday we all must face eternity. And unless we have a savior, we all must face the wrath of God. With a repentant heart, this man, this man recognized that Jesus was the savior that he needed. And so he cried out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, he heard Jesus call out to the father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And just hearing those simple words changed everything for that man. It changed his opinion of Christ. It changed his opinion of himself. And it changed the outcome for eternity. Two men, but only one understood the value of the Christ cross. And that made all the difference for eternity. I wonder, I wonder, do we understand the value of the cross? Because, see, the problem is, if we don't understand the value of the cross, we also don't understand the value of the resurrection or the value of Easter. Let me tell you about an annual event in a church in Georgia. Every year on Easter, the church was beautifully decorated with 500 lilies. The lilies were a chain arranged on the church chancel in the shape of a cross. They were decorated in all the windowsills around the church. They were on the altar rail, on the choir loft, literally everywhere you looked in the church, all you saw were Easter lilies. Each year, the members of the church were given the opp opportunity to donate an Easter lily in honor or memory of a loved one for only $5. And for $5, they didn't have to bother with going to purchase a lily or with dealing with taking it home or doing anything with it after the services. The church took care of everything. People just assumed that after all the services were over, someone just took the lilies to shut-ins or nursing homes or hospitals or whatever. Everything went well until one particular Easter when after a service, a dear, sweet, elderly lady went back into the sanctuary after a service and said, you know, my sister is in a nursing home and she's not doing well. I would like to take a lily to her. I'm just going to go over and pick out a lily to take to my sister. Before anyone could stop her, she went over to the nearest window and grabbed a lily. And then in a loud voice, a voice loud enough to hear her in the farthest parking lot, she exclaimed with horror and dismay, oh my goodness, it's plastic. People rushed back into the sanctuary. They began carefully looking at all the Easter lilies only to discover that every single last one of them, sure enough, was plastic. 
an emergency board meeting was called for the next evening. The pastor and the chairman of the board felt as if they were before a firing squad. One member after another shot question after question at the pastor and the chairman of the board. Just how long has this been going on? Where in the world do you hide 500 plastic lilies every year? And the one question repeated over and over again, just what have you been doing with all those $5 donations every year? The chairman tried to explain that there was nothing dishonest about the $5 donations. Each year, half of the money raised went to the church's regular budget. The other half went to missions around the world. The pastor chimed in, and do you know what usually happens to live Easter lilies after the Easter service? Half of them get left at the church only to die and end up in the dumpster. And the ones that are taken home, well, people water them for a while until the bulbs start to fall off and then they're tossed out with the trash. We just thought that was a terrible waste. And you wouldn't want to waste Easter, would you? See, that's the problem. We waste Easter when we don't value the cross or the resurrection. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been ripped around Christ's head. The cloth was still lying in his place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. He saw and believed. Before that morning, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he had believed in Christ. He had believed that Jesus was the Messiah sent from God. But now, Jesus or John saw and believed in the resurrection. Thomas said that he would not believe until he placed his hand in the hole in Christ's side. He would not believe until he placed his finger in the hole in Christ's wrist. Christ said, but blessed are those who believe even though they have not seen. Do you believe? Paul wrote, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day, third day. Peter wrote, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. If we believe in the cross and believe in the resurrection, if we value the cross and value the resurrection, if we, like that repentant thief on the cross, recognize our sin and our need 
of a savior. If we cry out to Jesus, placing our faith in him, then we have a better future on the horizon. We have a living hope. For the thief on the cross, it was today you will be with me in paradise. For us, it's someday you will be with me in paradise. If we believe. Let me tell you about Philip. Philip never felt as if he belonged. Philip was pleasant enough, but he looked a bit different. And sometimes he seemed unusual to his eight-year-old classmates. In his Sunday school class, several weeks before Easter, Philip's teacher introduced a new project. She gave every member of the class a big plastic egg. She explained that each child was to go outside and find a symbol that best represented Easter, something that best represented the resurrection, new life, and whatever it was, place that symbol in the egg. Enthusiastically, the whole class responded. Back in class a few weeks later, the eggs were opened one at a time with each child explaining the meaning of their symbol. The first egg, it contained a pretty flower. The next, a beautiful butterfly. Green grass was in the third. The children oohed and awed as each egg was opened. One egg contained a rock and that prompted some laughter. Finally, the last egg was opened. In it, nothing. That's stupid, said one of the children. Another grumbled, somebody didn't do it right. The teacher felt a tug on her skirt. It was Philip. That's my egg. And I did do it right. It's empty because the tomb was empty. There was unusual thoughtful silence. And strangely, from that time on, Philip was accepted. Philip became part of the group. Philip continued to struggle with health problems. That summer, Philip picked up an infection. It was something that most children just shake off easily. But Philip's body was weak and he just couldn't shake off the infection. And a few weeks later, Philip died. At his funeral, nine eight-year-olds with their Sunday school teacher leading the way brought their symbol of remembrance and placed it near Philip's coffin. Their gift of love wasn't flowers, it was an empty egg. Now a symbol to them of hope and new life. It was Philip, this different child, who helped his friends see the wonderful hope in the message of Easter, the message of the empty tomb. For in the message of the empty tomb is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise to each and every one of us that we, if we understand the value of the cross and the value of the resurrection, if we only believe that we have hope and new life. Billy Graham told of a meeting he had with Conrad Adenauer, former mayor of Cologne, Germany. Adenauer had been imprisoned by Hitler for opposing the Nazi regime. Adenauer became the first chancellor of the West German Federal Republic. Adenauer truly deserved the title of statesman 
as he picked up the broken pieces of his country and helped rebuild it after World War II. On this occasion, Adenauer looked the evangelist straight in the eye and said, Mr. Graham, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Billy, somewhat surprised by the question, answered, of course I do. Replied Adenauer, Mr. Graham, outside of the resurrection of Christ, I do not know of any hope for this world. G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton once wrote that hope means hoping when things are hopeless or it means nothing at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, Chesterton said, hope is mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be strength. When you know the value of the cross and the value of the resurrection and the value of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there is always hope. And that's the message of Easter, that there is always hope, no matter what you're facing, even if you're hanging on a cross. Father, this morning, no matter what we are experiencing in our lives, no matter what we see on the news or read in the paper, help us to value the cross. Help us to value the resurrection and help us to believe in the cross and the resurrection. Help us to believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord and know that there is always hope because of Christ who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, may he strengthen you in hope enrich you in love and fill you with his joy in faith now and always amen mm -hmm.